So we're gonna roll oh. this uh, song. Uh, you got it teed up? Yeah. Oh. All right. Yeah, I'm ready. Uh, it's uh, <laughs> it's uh, well, yeah, hit it. Oh yeah. <laughs> A little bit of foreigner. Shane, what episode is this? This is. <laughs> I think it's 40, 40 something. It's forty eight. <laughs> episode zero four eight. <laughs> 048, yeah. that is right. Business Broken to Smoking Podcast. Uh, we got Jeremy Lyle here from uh, Heart to Heart, right? Is it a, is it a nonprofit? It is a, a nonprofit. We, yes. we always describe ourselves as a fee for service nonprofit because I do think sometimes people hear nonprofit and think, oh, well, you don't charge anything or you don't <laughs> make money. And no, you know, we got yeah. to keep the lights on. And pay that's bills. a for profit. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> They are generally pretty bad at figuring out how much money they've actually made. But uh, so we got this song, uh, "Foreigners uh, Head Games," yeah, which I thought would be really funny. Uh, lead in because we're talking about assessments. We're talking about how to figure out what's inside of somebody. Yeah, we've been on this little kick of uh, multiple sessions yeah. or multiple episodes around that. So yeah, been really excited to talk to you about what you know and what you use over there heart to heart and um you know what your clients find value in and how you help them um and especially around you know popping the popping the hood on a leader yeah and and helping them figure out what's down there so jeremy lyle thank you awesome great to be here why don't you t- oh, great to be here Great to be here with you. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks for letting me be with you. <laughs> Jeez. Um, tell, first of all, tell us about the organization. Yeah. So, and I will say it is great to be here. And thank you for <laughs> inviting me to come and share. And just really looking forward to this opportunity. And I was thinking in preparation, one of the things is that, that lead off question of, you know, tell us about the organization. Part of it is I feel like you usually get that elevator pitch and it's just, it doesn't quite do it justice. It's hard to explain all the nuance. Um, but essentially I will try the elevator pitch of, uh, we are a fee for service nonprofit. And a main reason that we stay in that space, we've been around for 30, over 30 years, um, really almost 35 now. But the main reason that we exist and, and stay kind of in that nonprofit space is, um, you know, really, we're, we're very community-based, very, uh, you know, greater Akron-centric. We are willing to go outside of that, but just kind of we feel like the work has not uh, been fully saturated where we are. Um, but, you know, it's, there's, there's plenty of opportunity in other places and do go outside of that on occasion. But anyhow, the main point is that, um, you know, we want to be able to elevate the level of leadership in our community. And we believe that, you know, core mission is that as we do that, uh, it has a ripple effect on everybody else that as leaders are more thoughtful, more aware, more intentional, more purposeful, uh, they're going to be thinking about the bigger issues and be a little less selfish per- perhaps and a little more selfless and just, you know, how how is my leadership affecting the whole and, and addressing broader societal issues and um, all those kinds of things. And then the, the nonprofit aspect allows us to do have a fundraising component, whether it's through, we have an annual breakfast event called the Greater Akron Speaks Out for Values Breakfast. We just celebrated our 30th annual back Mm -hmm. in May. Um, But then we also get grant funding and individual donations that allow us to provide scholarships, allow us to provide our services at rates that that tend to be lower than maybe your your typical uh, for-profit consultancy um, while still leveraging and and delivering the, the the same quality of programs and services, so you know, incredibly mission driven and um, and yeah, so uh, and, and the approach, I guess, the other piece I would say about that approach is we've kind of whittled it down to this this catchphrase of look within, lead beyond, and the idea there is. And we wrestled for a long time. I actually had a singer-songwriter friend of ours kind of help me narrow that down because, uh, you know, how, how do you capture this, uh, some, some others have described it, this inside-out approach to leadership development, um, but that it's not just navel-gazing. It's not just a, a deep introspection of, wow, that's, that's really interesting. Um, now I know a little bit more about myself, but then that lead beyond 
aspect says, now go do something with it. Is it, is it just overcoming some of your own fears and anxieties? Is it getting to know your business better? Is it uh, just showing up more intentionally and purposefully for your people or for your wider community even? So, um, so that's, that's been a way to really kind of help us narrow down that perspective and say, we're not, uh, we, we talk about the heart to heart way, uh, you know, kind of four A's that starts with awareness. What are the things that are coming into your consciousness that you're, you're starting to focus on? And, um, you know, then an appreciation that, hey, I do have some unique gifts, talent, skills, um, and, and weaknesses as well. But also I'm a, maybe learning to appreciate that others don't see the world the same way that I do. And there's different uh, perspectives and approaches to things. Then it's authenticity. Okay, what do I do with this awareness and these things that I'm learning to appreciate how do I really integrate them in an authentic way that allows me to show up uh, courageously, vulnerably, just knowing who I am and, and leading from that place? And then the application piece. Again, all that's great, but if it just kind of stays up in that headspace um, or head games, if, if I can stay on brand there, um, although it would have been nice if we could have found heart games maybe, but, you know. Uh, no, but, you know, how, how do we move it from – that that just that cerebral to to our hands you know head heart and hands and right. really get it integrated into our mm -hmm. our workplaces into our leadership mm -hmm. so yeah that's a, a high level flyover of of those kinds of things i guess i should also say then the way that works it's out works itself out practically is we offer programs in a variety of kind of way programs and services We'll go into an organization and work with a whole team. I'm doing something tomorrow for 90 managers. Um, we're doing some, starting something next week. We're going to work with 167 employees at a, an entire organization. Mm -hmm. um, so we'll work with, with big groups or we'll work with a subset of the team. Maybe they've mm -hmm. got some you know, director level folks that they want to kind of bring together and, and, and unify as a leadership team and have them reflect on some of those things. One of the issues I'm, I'm seeing a lot right now is you know, kind of coming out of the pandemic and kind of the whole great resignation and a lot of void and gaps in organizations. A lot of people got moved into leadership positions out of necessity, but not necessarily with any preparation and intentionality. And so they're saying, hey, we, we have a lot of leaders that uh, haven't really been skilled to to step into these roles. And so they were great peers, but now they're they're struggling with some of the things that it takes to uh, lead those people who were their peers or just lead in the organization, yeah. those kinds of things. And then the last component is we also offer um, community-wide programs where people can just kind of register and sign up and come together, you know, Enneagram Workshop, which we'll, I know we'll talk more about, our Emerging Leaders Program. And then we have a flagship program called Purposeful Leadership Program, which is kind of a bringing together of all the best of what we've identified as the, the kinds of things that a leader needs in order to look within and lead beyond that, um, you know, you apply for, there's an acceptance process and, mm -hmm. um, you get, uh, six full days of programming plus six hours of one-on-one -on -one coaching and a 360 mm -hmm. feedback assessment. And so. what's the duration of that? What's it kind of the, yeah, so it meets just about every three weeks. So we run two a year. So we're, okay. we're actually set to launch. We just, uh, sent out acceptance letters earlier mm -hmm. this week and we'll have our biggest class ever of 20 people. And we keep, we keep kind of growing what our maximum take is just because the, the demand is so high and we want to make sure we're, uh, doing that while also keeping an mm -hmm. intimate feel. I feel like 20 is probably a threshold for that, but, um, so we're going to get, uh, or yeah, so they'll, they'll start in September and then finish in early December, uh, then we take a little break for a few months and then kick back off in March, mm -hmm. okay. uh, you know, and run through usually late May, early June. So, um, yeah. Interesting. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so you said a uh, big gap here. One cat, one gap is, uh, I would say default people, people are leaders by default be, mm -hmm. become or end up, or they look around and go like, well, I guess I'm doing it. Yeah. You know? And, <laughs> um, yeah, I see that as well with uh, many of my clients, uh, partly COVID, partly family-based, uh, where they're drawing from a pool of one, you mm -hmm. know, like, hey, let's interview uh, one person, you know, my neighbor or my cousin or my brother or my kid or my wife or, or my dad or my son, um, or this person who's been here for 12 years and they must be next in line. Right. You know, uh, and often it's just they just didn't quit. Everybody else quit, you know, and so they're the only ones left. 
uh, from 12 years ago. Um, so, so what do you, um, what, what do you feel like are some of the outcomes of what heart to heart does, or maybe what are some of the, what does it look like when the needle moves yeah. for a leader? So a leader comes in and are like, Jeremy, help me out here. Yeah. Uh, you guys help him out. And he goes away and he's like, I've been helped. Now I'm good at this. Now I'm better at this. So yeah. what, what are kind of some deliverables? Yeah. So somewhat depends on on the unique situation in person, but I would say some of those things center around kind of leadership presence. I'm, I'm more accessible and available and intentional when I'm with my people. Uh, a great article that we have people read is uh, Harvard Business Review. If you if you aspire to be a great leader, be present, and um, and so just teach them how to be more in the moment. Put the phone away. Stop checking the texts that are flying in on your uh, you know smartwatch and your emails while you're you're there. Um, a, a better communicator. Um, you know, able to really just kind of stand in their space and own that. Uh, again, I think part of that just plays back into some of that accidental leadership or that inherited leadership of, well, that was just the way that somebody else did it. And the examples we have of leadership culturally in our organization, whatever, you know, that's how so-and-so always did it instead of what's my own authentic voice. How, how do I want to communicate and show up? Um, so, you know, those are a, a couple of the things I think um, the other one is that, that sense of how do you bring others along into your vision? How do you help them um, live out the core values? It's great to have these things on our websites and on our walls, but what about the lived core values and, and I'm modeling those? And so, um, you know, they're going to get deeper in touch with their own sense of purpose and values, how that's being lived out in the organization and inviting others and empowering others to engage in those kinds of things. Um, they're also going to be equipped to lead better through times of change and complexity and, and chaos. And we do hear that oftentimes from folks as well of just, you know, I'm, I was more prepared for that. I, I was intentional. Um, and then I guess the last thing I would say among a, a variety of other things is um, that piece of alignment. Just, okay, now that I have a little better sense of who I am, what I'm about, the things I want to focus on, I know what I'm inviting others to step into. And maybe we have a little more, know how to have those conversations around roles and responsibilities, around our working agreements, around some of the, you know, we call them deal busters of just what are the things that are going to disrupt us and keep us from being able to uh, effectively work together. And so, um, yeah, I think that alignment piece is really important, especially when it comes to culture. Mm. Um, yeah. Yeah, that's great. And it's hard to do that. I, I find, you know, folks challenged with, going from, <clears throat> hey, great, thanks, great idea. I uh, like the idea of these, yeah. you know, these values are great, for example, or whatever. But now what do I do with them? Mm -hmm. uh, now how do I how do I actually get these values down into the uh, the, the, the core of the business? Right. Um, and, and make them very, uh, I don't know, practical, make them a part of our everyday vernacular, part of our hiring, firing process. Right part of our management process, yeah. you know, promotional process, all that stuff. Mm -hmm. um, so I love that. Yeah. And I think, again, back to that empowering piece, like how do you create the kind of culture where people feel empowered to celebrate when they see those things being enacted and, and reward them in a variety of different ways, uh, but also to hold people accountable to them as well and say, Hey, even if I know I may not get a slap on the wrist for this this time, a cumulative effect of those things, or, or again, that it's not even it doesn't even have to be about kind of a punitive fear base, but just this is what we're all about, and I'm an ambassador of these things. I I know that it's good for me, for the organization, and our overall productivity and profitability. Um, to to live in alignment with these things. And so I'm going to commit to doing those, even if it means owning up to a difficult uh, situation. I, I 
grew up in a home of entrepreneurs, mm. um, started a family business out of our basement. And, uh, and I remember my dad telling me like, Jeremy, we're not necessarily always going to be the fastest. It was a fundraising uh, business. So, you know, a lot of deliveries back and forth and managing those kinds of things, sales. Um, but, you know, he said, we're, we may not always be the fastest. We may not always be the cheapest, but people know that if we say we're going to be there on time, we will be there on time. If for some reason we're not going to, we're going to call them and, and let them know. And if we make a mistake, we're going to make it right and, and follow through. And again, I think sometimes we, we make things way more complex than they need yeah. to be. And I think just simplifying yeah. it down to some of those pieces of, you know, good people who genuinely want to do good work. And I think those people are greater than maybe sometimes we realize or even acknowledge, um, you know, I, when, when my kids are struggling and having a tough day of just something hard going on in the world or so that I remind them, the vast majority of, I don't know, we're at 7 billion people now in the world, like the vast majority of them show up each day and, mm -hmm. you know, punch in their, their, their hours and go to work and want to love their families well, do their part to kind of contribute and give back to society. And um, so, you know, remember those kinds of things. It was the Fred Rogers thing. I think, you know, his mom told him that, you know, look for the helpers, you know, when you're getting yeah. down, look, look for those people. And so again, um, Steve Millard and I at the Great Akron Chamber have talked about that a little bit of just, yeah, that, that I don't think people, the vast majority of people don't wake up thinking, I want to make somebody's day miserable. I want to just, you know, derail our, our workflow or uh, the profitability of this organization. But um, we have our default modes and, and our, our blind spots that just, hang us up. So, um, so I guess that'd be the other piece I would add in there about the, the outcomes is just, and I know it sounds a little bit squishy. And so part of it is like, sometimes you just have to sit in that space with people, but the higher levels of awareness too, that, that, that they gain an agency that maybe you didn't see before that it's like, now I'm, I can kind of look at myself a bit objectively. And even, you know, in that mindfulness space of just noting my thoughts and feelings and say, Hmm, look at me yeah. showing up in this kind of way or look at me acting like this. That, that's not who I want to be. So how do I choose to show up differently? How do I choose to, um, yeah, do any of those other kinds of things we talked about? Be more present, communicate more effectively, give, give better feedback, uh, get people in alignment. So I think it really, so much of it comes back to that. And I guess we'll, we'll touch on some of those things, I'm sure, too, as we go along. Yeah, I wonder if there's a, it, what, what sort of assessment or... Val eval evaluation tool is there around EQ? Would you call that EQ like self awareness, kind of self objectivity, um, that sort of thing? Yeah, I think it's. I think there's a level of of that that's EQ. I'll be fully transparent. I've not done a ton of research on EQ, so maybe it fully aligns with it. But from from what I understand, um, I think it it's a little bit broader than that. Um, that that it's. Um, yeah, I can. I think it can kind of blend into both EQ and IQ, and uh, you know some of those kinds of things. But um, as far as assessments go, I, I think there's a number of those. And Mark, I know you and I have chatted <laughs> in a variety of settings about all the options that are out there. And um, and in in some ways, I, I encourage organizations like find one and stick with it. I think is part of it. I, yeah. I see kind of the shiny new object uh, approach a lot, where it's you know, they, well, this one's hot now and everybody's doing this. So we need to do this. And well, you haven't really fully let that other one settle into your culture yet. So play that out. And if it's not working for you, abandon it by all means. Um, but, you know, at least give it some time. Don't just go from one to the next and, and then your people are over assessed. And it's like, oh, my gosh, you know, I have to keep in mind 30 different things that, that uh, you know, when I'm approaching somebody or something. But one that that's my personal favorite that we is actually our most requested at heart to heart is the Enneagram personality system. And, um, again, I don't know how deep you want me to go with that right now, but just to say that is why I love it is because it, it gets to that core motivation place. And I think does what I haven't seen others do yet as far as that self and other awareness piece. It really begins to give you an appreciation for here's my core motivation and what's 
inspiring me and how I'm showing up and, and mm. can affect any number of other areas around communication, leadership styles, work styles, conflict, resolution, and feedback. You know, so there's all these kinds of jumping off points for it. Um, but then also to say in any given situation or circumstance, there's eight other core motivations present, potentially, not you know always, but potentially, that uh, are going to be looking at this a little bit differently. And so how do I at least take that into account and, and just be mindful of that to say, hey, okay, yes, me as an Enneagram 3, efficiencies, achievement, goal orientation, that's great, but somebody else may need some details and some specificity. Somebody might need me to be a little bit more blunt and forthright. Um, you know, somebody else is going to need some some time and space to go into that creative mode. And they might need to wander around there for a while when I'm saying, hey, you've had enough time, you know, let's, let's get out here and, and make this happen now or yesterday. So again, it's, it's yeah, I, I just, from, from a, an awareness standpoint, I've yet to experience something or, or yeah, experience myself or come across something that I think really drills down into that, um, yeah, that self-awareness piece, hmm. giving you that, that sense of agency to yeah. decide how you're going to show up and all those things. So, so with Enneagram, and I want to ask you a bunch about Enneagram or have you talk a bunch about it both. Yeah. Um, so would you summarize it as, uh, at least as its value? primary value, uh, identifying where your motivation comes from or what mm -hmm. kind of drives you, mm -hmm. what, what your driver is? Yeah. Yeah. I think it really is. Yeah. But that, that's kind of when you boil it down, it's that mm -hmm. core motivation mm -hmm. piece. So it okay. goes a little bit deeper than how it's, you know, how you're expressing yourself or behavioral yeah. kinds of things. Yeah. It might indicate some of those things, but, and, and we may touch on this too, you know, uh, what am I trying to say? Integrating it or, or using it with layering it with other uh, types of assessments as well. Clifton Strengths, DISC, any a number of other assessments. It it lays a solid foundation that then you can say, okay, you know, me and another Enneagram three. Yes, that core motivation might be the same, but the way that it gets expressed through our talents and kind of more of the um, you know performance based side of that could look very different and it might not be exactly what you expect. So, um, yeah, but I, I like it as, as a, a foundational piece. Cause I think mm -hmm. once we get a sense of that, then we can build so many other things off of that solid foundation. Do you have a good, uh, what's, what's your suggestion as a go-to to take the Enneagram? Cause I know there's a bunch of stuff online. Yeah. Yeah. Is and so a... our go-to and, and again, I'm, I'm not snobbish enough to think that it's the only one out there, but just one that we have found to be really helpful. It is scientifically validated, so I like that. I might be a little bit biased because it was validated at the University of Akron, but um, it's the uh, Ready R H E T I assessment, Riso Hudson um, Enneagram Test Instrument. Instrument, I think that stands for. Don't quote me on that. Um, but it's you know 144 questions, and you get a list out then of kind of rank order scoring. And so part of what I like about that is a lot of the other free ones out there, or even other ones that I've seen, you get your results, and those are your results. We are confident that we have assessed you correctly. Whereas this one. It says, no, there could be all kinds of different factors playing into, like even someone I was with yesterday said, I put my employee hat on and I was thinking about this through the lens of my employment. I wonder if it would have been a little bit different had I taken it through my personal right. uh, life. Now, right. as we went through the, the process a little yeah. bit more in the workshop, then he said, no, I actually think this is... It shows up differently and I express it differently, but no, that, that definitely is that core motivation. But anyhow, so I, I like that one because it, it really allows you to try it on. And, and I always say, you know, yeah, wear it like your, you know, Goldilocks or something. And, you know, eh, it's, this, this doesn't fit quite right or it's you know, too hot or too cold. But sometimes you got to try it on for a little bit and, and allow those environmental factors, those personal, professional, those nature versus nurture things to kind of... Uh, vet themselves out a little bit. I, I know for me, I thought for sure I was an Enneagram 2, the helper, because um, first 10 years of my career, my boss was the quintessential helper. He was, you know, Enneagram 2 to the extreme, and it was just the culture that we were in. You, you 
are there for anybody at any time and, um, you know, do whatever you can to help. And so it's like, well, that's what we have to do. Um, but you know, as I got out of that environment, got in, connected into heart to heart and more of a, a senior leadership role, it's like, oh no, I actually love the like strategy vision, um, hmm. achieving, you know, setting goals and accomplishing yeah. them kind yeah. of side of things. So, yeah. Well, so give me that again, the R H E T I. Um, right. and if you go to the Enneagram Institute website, mm-hmm. you can take it you know, you have to pay. It's, I think, $12 per assessment. Okay. If we do it in an organization, we get sometimes, depending on the size of them, a little bit of a bulk discount and stuff. Okay. But, um, yeah. So that's great. Yeah, yeah. We'll have to do that. Shane. Yeah. Yeah. Take I, that one. Cause we took the mm-hmm. free, I, I don't even remember when I took it. It's been six or eight years ago. Yeah. But all right. So, so there's that. And so now go through the numbers. We know, we know they're nine. Yeah. Um, to give like a, I'm one minute, like, where the heck did this thing come from? <laughs> oh, well, that's the, the other fun piece is nobody actually knows where it came from. There is no exact yeah. origin point. Um, there's some who would say it's, you know, typically kind of land on more of a Eastern, um, some would say Sufi tradition, others would say the Desert Fathers. Um, but, but really, that's part of what I love about it. Others freaks them out. But um, that it it is kind of collective wisdom passed down through the ages and saying, hey, these are these personality archetypes, mm-hmm. how they show up. Um, you know, then it kind of goes through, spend some time um, going through the West and through England, then lands in South America. Um, and, and Claudio Naranjo and Oscar Ichazo kind of, uh, you know, do some work with it. And then it eventually makes its way into the United States, mostly initially as kind of a, a personal not necessarily psychological, but, you know, social emotional kind of tool to just, yeah, again, understand more about your own core motivations and everything. And then I would say Ginger Lapid Bagda, who I've done some certification under and, and has really been the one who took it from more of that personal dimension to now more of the business side of things. She has the, the Enneagram, Enneagram and business website and, um, you know, said, hey, how, how does this really show up for us in these kinds of ways, yeah. um, you know, as we're working together and all those different dynamics. So, yeah, so unfortunately, I don't have an easy, clean answer for you. It doesn't have people's names, you know, yeah, Donna sure. Clifton didn't right. create this or, right. you know, Isabella Myers and, right. and I always forget Briggs, but, you know, yeah. Myers-Briggs or something. It's, right. yeah, but. Again, part of what I like about it is it says it's not as maybe manipulated by one yeah. group of people or something, and yeah. and it's and it has Eastern and Western, so there's maybe not as much cultural bias. So anyhow, yeah, that's so practically. I mean, mm-hmm. so somebody takes this, so that's, mm-hmm. and we we know a number of people have taken it and all that. <clears throat> so let's start with kind of takeaways, as in, uh, so yeah, let's say some some CEOs like, well, Jeremy, we took the anagram and. Uh, we got all these numbers and I fired half of them and we promoted the other half, you know, and you're like, buddy, yeah. <laughs> pump, pump the brakes. Last episode, pump the brakes or a couple, a couple ago. Right. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So, um, so, so on the tail end, you know, first just kind of say, talk a little bit about what folks should do. Yeah. Especially, you know, we're, we're speaking to business owners, operators, mm-hmm. leadership team people right. here on the podcast primarily. Yeah. Uh, so they run off and take it or their folks do what's, what's kind of a good next step for them, regardless of their number. Yeah. So first of all, I would say don't use it for hiring and firing. I don't think it's Mm. beneficial in that kind of way. And kind of back to what I said earlier that, yeah, it tells you about the core motivation, but it doesn't tell you about the character of the person. It doesn't tell you about their motive, their, um, you know, their, their integrity, um, and, and you know, even just how some of those things manifest themselves. So it doesn't mean, for example, Enneagram type ones tend to be a little bit more detail oriented, policy, process, procedure folks. But it doesn't mean that every single Enneagram one wants to be in this narrow box focused on, you know, only those kinds of things. And, And in fact, leaders can be any of the nine types. Sure, we as a Western culture value Certain, I would say threes and eights probably uh, above others, but you can be any type. So if you take it and you kind of get the sense of, you know, hey, now I've got these nine numbers swirling around and or people are <laughs> trying to figure out who they are and they can't settle on one of these, um, you know, the a shameless plug would be contact us and we'll, right, we'll work right. with you. But, um, <laughs> you know, but but there are a number of resources out there as well. Um, what type of leader are you is one of the books by Ginger Lapid Bagda. Um, 
But then I would say, you know, do some exploration, do some study and research on uh, how do you want to utilize it? Do you want it as something to help, um, you know, just you personally as a leader and, and the impact that you're having and, and kind of that more self-awareness piece? Do you want to use it on your teams and begin to explore some of the team dynamics and the different work styles, some of the communication pieces? So, I mean, really the application is broad and, and again, part of why I like it because um, once you understand that core motivation, then you can begin to um, talk a little bit more. And, and, and I've started to do this more and more with organizations too. say like, let's make this real. Let's make it practical. Let's not just stay up in the theoretical and say, um, you know, well, yeah, I as a three like accomplishing things. Well, okay, but tell me, how does that impact the people around you? Well, sometimes it means I'm pushing too hard and too fast and I'm bowling over people and I'm, I'm not really paying attention to uh, the more relational dynamic or not making sure that we're crossing the I's and dotting the T's, whatever those things may be. So um, yeah, so I think then you, you kind of need to say, how do we want this to apply? Are we trying to bring about a culture shift? Are you trying to get a team in better alignment? Are we trying to raise up uh, next level of leaders in our organization and, um, you know, and then do some research on that, find some great resources or, you know, contact us and we'll come talk to you more about it. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and, I think that's great. Yeah. And we have a, a program, shameless plug here again, but, um, that our, our full blown program starts off with kind of just a high level intro and overview sets you up to take the online assessment and then we do six hours after that where you are looking at work styles, specifically communication and feedback, and then kind of leading through change and ongoing applications. So um, that's been the fun thing is some organizations where they do it, they begin to integrate it into their culture, and then they take it and run with it in a lot of different directions. And, and part of what's nice about it too is one, it's not static, it's dynamic. So it's it's not, here's your report and this tells you everything about you. It's, hey, this is most likely true about you, but some some aspects of this yeah. may not be true. And you're ha we're, we're giving you insights into your best development and growth opportunities and, and your blind spots and things you need mm -hmm. to be aware of. Um, but also it's fun. So mm -hmm. we'll go into organizations and f follow up or, or do another work with them. And sometimes it's like, Ah, you know, if, especially if it's a large organization, I don't remember your name, but I remember your Enneagram type, or they'll come right up to us and say, you know, hey, you remember me? I'm a type seven or whatever those things may be. So um, it, it has a lot of kind of ongoing uh, application. And then, as I said, I wouldn't encourage you to use it for hiring, but once you make that decision, and hopefully you can use it as your thinking about that interviewing process to just say what kinds of qualities and characteristics might I be looking for? So not to type other people because you want to be careful about that, mistyping them, um, let it, let them self assess. But uh, yeah, but it can give you an insight of, Hey, I know again for myself that I'm kind of more big picture efficiency. Let's get it done. I, I need someone to compliment me who has more of those detail orientation, follow through, um, you know, technical kinds of, uh, yeah, mm -hmm. focus. Um, but anyhow, so once, once you do onboard folks, then you can have them take it as part of that or in the onboarding process, I should say, to then begin to understand, okay, well, maybe we hired them for an incredibly technical dimension of this work or, or role, but they're more of the creative and, um, you know, strategic type, um, it doesn't mean they can't do the job. And that's why I say don't don't hire and fire because of that. But it may mean we just have to be a little more intentional about drawing that out. One of my favorite examples of that is um, we did we did this with the entire 120 staff at the Akron Zoo. And then have, have we follow up every six months or so and mm -hmm. with any new folks they've hired. Um, so gosh, probably over 200 people now over the last five years that have gone through it with us. But um, they had one person on their grounds team that was – um, you know, one of his responsibilities was to water the flowers every day. And I can't remember if he was a seven or a four, but both of them are more in the creative space, kind of, you know, keep the options open, big picture, uh, you know, want to do things uniquely and, um, and, and spontaneously. And, uh, and he specifically said to the type ones who want process policy order, um, like, I will get it done 
But if I don't have some creative license in how I go about watering these flowers, like I'm not going to hang, you know, I'm not going to last very long. And so again, it wasn't that he couldn't do the job, sure. but it was that lens or that perspective that we may look through and say, well, they're not doing it the way I would do it. Well, okay. But are they getting it done and, and in yeah. a timely way and stuff? So anyhow. So take, take a few minutes then and go mm-hmm. through, uh, so on Enneagram specifically, yeah. just explain uh, each number. There's nine numbers. You take the mm-hmm. test and out comes this, you know, hey, you're a this with a yeah. wing of something <laughs> and a... Yeah. And a side dish of <laughs> right. that. And arrows and lines yeah, and all these different and things. So, yeah. And so I don't want to take too much time on that. And again, I would caution against an assessment that spits out, you are this yes. and this is your wing. I think it's much better to say, here's here's the scoring of this. Okay. Take into account, were you thinking more personal, professional? Which one's more true to you? Um, take mm-hmm. into account... Nature versus nurture. Did your background tell you that, uh, you know, you needed to be this way? Or I've even had, uh, you know, women say, hey, I grew up in an era where some of the only opportunities for me were more administrative or helping roles or a woman's places in the home. Again, I want to be clear. I'm not espousing that. I'm just saying they grew up in that culture and in that environment. Um, And so, you know, I must either be a one or a two. I had to. Mm -hmm. But no, actually... I think I'm more of an eight, but I never was able to express that. Or, you know, a, a black participant who has said the same thing. I feel like I'm an eight, but if I step up and challenge or if I express that anger, even in a healthy way, suddenly cultural label says angry black man or angry, angry black woman. And so we have to be aware of some of those cultural factors and all those kinds of things. So high level, um, so the way that the nine types are broken into three different centers, the head, the heart, and the gut or body or instinct centers, kind of that last one, eight, nine, and one. Um, people often ask me, why does the heart center start with two and not with one and then just kind of go around nicely? Well, there weren't numerical values added to it until later. And so it's just the way it broke out uh, based on that. But yeah, so uh, heart center, the two, the three, and the four, they're reacting to life circumstances based on, um, you know, kind of more of their feelings and image, you know, how do others perceive me? How am I in relationship to others? So that's going to be kind of the primary filter that they're going to receive uh, or experience life circumstances, react to life circumstances. Uh, The two is kind of more of the stereotype of what you think of when you hear the word heart. They're the helper, the giver. If they're not uh, supporting others and, and giving out, they don't feel alive. They, they, they feel like they're, you know, they, they have no reason for existence. And so they really want to give back in that way. The threes and, and typically the middle. So the first in each center is kind of more the, the stereotype of what you might think of. The middle one is more mediated. And then the last one tends to be a little bit more kind of... Um, subverted or, or internalized. So, um, but I'll talk about that in a second. The threes in that more mediated. Yeah, we care about relationships and how others see us, but we tend to be a little more task oriented as well. I want to get things done. I want to make things happen. I, I always joke that. Um, so yeah, they're the achiever. Um, some call them that, um, you know, but the efficiency is really important. I walk into a restaurant or a store or something and I'm complaining to my wife, or even the you know the the place where you really see my my worst self come out is in the uh, airport uh, you know check in line or security line or whatever you know why don't why don't they have their shoes off why is their belt still on why is their phone you know come on like let, let's get this moving here so again I can't not experience those things it's just second nature I walk in and that's what I'm thinking about mm-hmm. is this could be so much more efficient if um, so uh, again that's that's kind of that is so it's still in the heart center relationship is important I care about how others see me but do they see me as accomplished and successful and achieved mm-hmm. the fours tend to more internalize those feelings and uh, they want to be seen as unique they they tend to be very creative um, I often joke my wife is a type four I'm like she knows what I'm feeling before before I know what I'm feeling, very intuitive and discerning. Um, and, and oftentimes you'll even see that just not always, but they tend to be drawn to artistic expression in some ways, creative expression in some ways. So, um, you know, that's, that's those folks, those, those feelings for them get internalized a little bit more, whereas the two is kind of externalized. You know, what are you feeling and how can I help, uh, you know, either make you feel even better than you already do or help you feel better if you're, you're not feeling so great. Um, then moving into the head center, five, six, and seven. 
head reacts to life circumstances based on fear um, and, and kind of how do we make sense of it all? How does it all fit together? How do I mitigate fear? So the, the first one, the five being more that stereotype, they want to be objective, rational, subject matter experts. Do I know what, uh, you know, have I had time to really delve into this? Don't, don't make me make a quick decision. I need to research this. I need to study it, understand it. Mm -hmm. um, and that's how I mitigate fear is I understand it. I make sense of it. And I always like to pause here too and just say, this is one of those ways that you can just see natural conflict arising. You put a four and a five together on a team and four saying, feelings are everything and fives are saying rational objective thought is everything well there's just going to be natural conflicts that arise from that that right. not wrong just different you know what what that motivation is uh sixes they mitigate fear by uh being strategic and planning worst case scenario what if kinds of people um often use the example of my daughter in this scenario when she was really young i, I discourage you typing children as well, but sometimes it's just blatantly obvious. And for us, it was with our second oldest daughter. We went to Cedar Point in preparation for the day. She packs a fanny pack, a Sudoku, a granola bar, a pencil, just in case a ride breaks down, you know, wants to be prepared. Worst case scenario, what if uh, middle of the day, we're sitting there eating ice cream, everybody's screaming, having fun. And she turns to my wife and I out of nowhere and says, uh, what do you think their fire evacuation plan is here at Cedar Point? You know, and you're like, what, what? I think she was 11 at the time. You know, what 11 year old is thinking about the fire evacuation plan at Cedar yeah. Point? But again, and this, this applies in the workplace too. How do we nurture that nature? If I just tell her, don't worry about it. Right. Well, that's not helpful. She's going to worry about it. So how do I harness that worry and say, okay, what are your concerns? How do I help mitigate those things? So, um, you know, th that's the sixes tend to be very loyal, group oriented, part of the team. Um, yeah. So five, six, and seven are all kind of fear, how they handle fear mm -hmm. or mm -hmm. from a... Yep. From a root. Yeah, fear. mitigate fear. Okay. And yeah, yeah. So again, it doesn't necessarily mean they're just walking around all the time, you know, yeah. afraid. But yeah, I have concerns that something could go wrong or I just, I haven't quite made sense of this. And then the sevens are kind of that more subversive side where they actually are a little bit more about like, I, I handle fear by just not focusing on it too much. I want to keep things light. I want to keep options open. I want to stay positive, um, tend to be able to be more adventurous, but also tend to be able to, um, you know, hold a lot of things in their head. Sometimes uh, sevens will say, you know, look at the Enneagram symbol. That's what the inside of my brain looks like. I can see how all the dots connect and uh, all these different pieces, but um, you know, others, it, it may just come out as a jumbled mess if I'm trying to explain it to mm -hmm. someone or, um, yeah, again, they, they tend to lose interest pretty quickly in things. Not always, again, these are stereotypes or, or over-exaggerated versions mm -hmm. of that. So it yeah. doesn't mean that, you know, a seven will never follow through. It just means typically they might need a little more accountability to follow through. Mm -hmm. So, and then last but not least, moving into that, uh, gut instinct body center, um, as, as it's referred to in, depending on which <laughs> practitioner you talk to, uh, they are more focused on, um, or reacting to life circumstances based on anger. And if you think about, you know, these things hit you first in the heart, first in the head, or first in the gut, you know, a little bit more reactionary, a little bit more kind of, you know, Hey, this is, this is what I want to do about this. So eights, tend to be that that stereotype a little bit more of, um, you know, they're going to face it head on. That that anger will show itself most likely in some kind of way. It doesn't mean necessarily that we're flipping over tables and, you know, angry, angry, but just, you know, I'm willing to challenge that thing. I'm, I'm yeah. willing to be direct and say, I, don't, I think that's BS. I, I don't really agree with what you're saying about that. So yeah, they're, they're, they can be called the challenger. Our, our favorite word for it is advocate, you know, that in, a, in its healthiest expression, wow, they're the ones you want in your corner who are going to go to bat for you, going to speak up for those who, who maybe don't have a voice and, um, you know, and, and, and fight for you in, in good and healthy ways and its healthiest expression, like I said. Uh, the nines, again, in that middle mediated position, they're the peacemakers. They're very good at, and their way of kind of dealing with anger is how do we resolve it? How do we help people see the different sides of this and then come to some level of agreement? Nines are really good kind of in that diversity, equity, inclusion space and saying, hey, have we ensured that all the different perspectives have been taken into consideration? Uh, but sometimes that can make it really hard for them to be decisive too, because they're like, well, 
I see the, the, the truth in their perspective and I see the truth in their perspective. We've had nines tell us that they get in trouble because two different employees will come to them and, and be complaining about something on two different sides of the issue. And they're just nodding saying yes as they listen. Well, their yes is, I hear you. I can see your side, but it's not, yes, I agree with you. Well, those two people go away and start talking to each other. And well, so-and-so agreed with me. Well, so-and-so agreed with me. Then they go back to the, you know, the, the leader and say, hey, you said yes to me. Well, you said yes to me. No, I didn't say yes to anybody. I just said, yes, I hear you. Now that I have the, the you know, perspective, now I can make a decision and hopefully bring some things together. So they, they can also tend to avoid conflict. Uh, and then last but not least, and I always say you might be a one if it bugs you that we end with one instead of starting with one. But, uh, you know, I do that based on the centers. But ones, again, more of that internalized anger. Um, again, our positive word for it because as is our nature, we tend to go to the negative much more easily. So people take the assessment and they automatically go to, you know, what's the worst <laughs> nuclear option for my type? What's the sociopathic tendencies of my type? Or here's, you know, the, just how I see the unhealth of this. No, they all have really good uh, qualities. And so we use the word reformer, um, you know, that, that they can identify inconsistencies, imperfections very easily and opportunities for improvement and call those out. Um, and they do that in healthy ways, but sometimes they can just make that opinion known, even if no one's looking for it. And they tend to internalize that anger. So, um, you know, they may come across to you like they're a little bit, uh, you know, black and white and, and expecting perfection from you, but I can guarantee you that they're holding themselves to an even higher standard and really, um, yeah, can, can struggle with some of that of just, you know, I'm never living up to, I'm not good enough. Uh, again, it might come out as others and to others in that way, but that's that's that. And then there's all kinds of things that if people really want to go down the rabbit hole, as you mentioned earlier, there's wings that kind of tend to be either one type or one type up or one type down from kind of your primary type. And it's saying, hey, I, I can relate to a lot of the qualities and characteristics of that. As a type three, I would say I'm a type three wing two. I, I relate to a lot of those two qualities. Um, then if you're looking at the system, there's also lines that connect you to other types. And those give you some indications of some of your best opportunities for development and growth and where you may go under stress and duress. Um, and then, you know, if you're really wanting to go down in the weeds, then there's even subtypes of each, three subtypes of each type, which I always say, don't start there. But if you're really struggling between a couple of types, you get that report back and you're like, hey, you know, gosh, I, I can see both of these things, then maybe explore subtype a little bit and it might create that level of nuance that really distinguishes, yeah, you know, a, a six subtype um, preserva self-preservation may have some similar qualities to uh, a, a type one or something. Mm. So, yeah, so there's, again. So I, there's, got, so I got advocate for eight. Right, that's your positive ones. Mm -hmm. Peace, yeah. Peacemaker nine, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. reformer is one. Mm -hmm. Right, mm -hmm. uh, number two or two giver. is giver. Mm -hmm. Okay, three achiever. Achiever, I missed that one. All right, and four. I believe the word we used for that was creator. Okay, and you'll be happy to know I put my uh, or asked my my enneagram for a wife to help me do that you okay. know, so she could yeah, find yeah. the unique expression of each sure of all right and how about five um five what did we use for five i know six was strategist um i'd have to go back and look at five because i you know some some call them uh you know the thinker or the the rationalist but i know mm -hmm. that's not the word we use so I, yeah i would yeah. put like engineer or architect or something mm -hmm. like that yeah, there, where they're some... they're very it sounds like at least they mm -hmm. have this very intentional Mm -hmm. Yeah, six is the strategist. Okay. And seven? Is the enthusiast. Enthusiast. Okay. And then if, when, um, so you mentioned like eight challenger. So what are some of those kind of classic, if we can, if you will, classic terms for yeah. those? And gosh. Uh, and give me seven again. I just forgot. Uh, uh, enthusiast. Enthusiast. Okay. Mm -hmm. All right. So Maybe, the classic We might use observer for five. Like Okay. Or, yeah, that sounds right. Yeah. Okay, so challenger for eight, mm -hmm. nine. I mean, do you remember the classic term? Classic term would be, I think, peacemaker. Okay. You know, that that one was a little bit more mm -hmm. kind of on the nose. Um, ones they call them the perfectionists. Mm -hmm. Twos tend to be the helper. Okay. I'm gonna keep going. Yep. 
Three. Uh, threes would be how? Oh, yeah, it's, I've been using these ones for so long. Um, it's not achiever. Yeah, honestly, it's it's not going to come to me right now. Okay. Um, uh, f four. Do you remember? Four would be. Um, I think they they use for that one like the individualist. Okay. Mm -hmm. Um, and I can't remember if we mentioned five, uh, I think that is where you tend to get more of like the thinker, mm -hmm. uh, or a rationalist. Okay. And six I've heard described as like the loyalist. Yes. Mm -hmm. That sounds right. And the, you know, the few sixes that I know that is, that rings yeah. totally true. You and I have a good buddy, <laughs> uh, good old Josh Gordon is a. Yeah. Yeah. But again, I think that doesn't capture the full beauty of that yeah, type it's pretty that, narrow sure. yeah right it's like oh well i'm just loyal to a, a fault or something it's like no you're also a strategist and you're yeah. you're thinking through those what ifs and those sure. plan b's um and then the sevens <laughs> one of the ones that i hear oftentimes is the cheerleader which mm. is like oh come on again yeah. like i just don't so think that's a little shallow yeah sure. exactly a little shallow so yeah when when i inherited some of our materials they even had like a clip art like attached to each of these things it was really bad but um cheesy but, yeah yeah sure. cheesy but and again i think that's partially why it's taken a while for the business side of this to catch up to sure. the, the benefits and, yeah. and value of this is hey it's not some cheesy introspective yes. uh assessment it, yeah. it really does sure impact the ways that you you do your business and make you more productive and it's been fun too to just see even specific articles coming out about you know the Enneagram and, and attorneys or the Enneagram in, you know, various professions and the, yeah. the health profession and stuff too. So, yeah. One of the things I think is a, uh, a bit of a, I don't know, a speed bump mm. for, 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 especially in an entrepreneurial space where <clears throat> not so much in a nonprofit space or the, maybe the institutional space uh, or the governmental or the corporate space, mm -hmm. but definitely in the, privately held entrepreneurial, you know, 10 to 200 employee kind of space. Yeah. Um, the kind of speed bump that they hit is like, look, this is a big deal, it, this business. And if we don't get this right, we're going to all like hit the side of the, the mountain. Yeah. And we're going to be talking about cheerleader number seven. Like, are you serious? And how much are we paying for this? Right. And, and I got like, I got shipments to get out. I got people yelling at me, the attorney's calling. I think the IRS has just sent me a thing. <laughs> You know, and it's like, come on, buddy. And you want us to do these dumb little numbers yeah. around. And so it's a little bit of a, it's a little bit of a, a high bar yeah. to kind of go, no, no, this is actually pretty important. Right. Um, and once they take these, t these assessments, then it's a little bit of a mystery of, all right, th this seems interesting, but what do I do with it now? How do I actually kind of quote, where's the money mm -hmm. in this? Not that it's all about money, but where's the quote money as in, all right, how am I going to take my team up a notch? Yeah. You know, now they know this person's a seven, this one's a four, this one's a, a nine, et cetera. And that's where we really start to push you and say, let's get, you know, gritty. Let's, yeah. let's get down to when you're going into that planning meeting, when you're working on that project, when you're dealing with the IRS or what, you know, trying to get that shipment out in time, through the lens of the Enneagram, and I think that's become one of my favorite phrases is, mm -hmm. again, it doesn't tell you everything about mm -hmm. everybody. And yeah. please, please, please do not weaponize this and, sure. and have it going, well, I already know everything about you. You're an eight, and so you're right. going to just come in and right. blow things up or yeah, sure. uh, you know, give give people permission to do that. Oh, but, wait, I do. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you're right. <laughs> no, I don't. Actually, I don't. Um, but yeah. you know, no, or, no. or or even use it as a an excuse maker for yourself too. Of oh well, I'm just you know I'm just a three. I'm just gonna push things forward and and forget about the people side of this. No, again, that objectivity. Hey, I know this is my tendency. What am I gonna do about it? What's the agency? And so similarly, I think when you when you begin to push it down into those very practical ways and say through the lens of the enneagram, you know, as we're making this decision, whether it's something we're deliberating about for hours or it's something we need to make a decision on in five minutes, it can be a quick tool to just say, what enneagram types are present right now? What are the what's the lens you're seeing this through, and what's important that we pay attention to? Yeah. You know, it can be as practical as that. It can be, um, you know, more high level of. What, what are your goals and your aspirations and, and how might your Enneagram type kind of play into some yeah. of that as well? I like how you said that these are, these are our motivational centers, you know, that helps me to understand, you know, cause I'm motivated by saying, all right, 
uh, what do we need to change here? Like, there's some things that aren't right and or that are stopping us. Yeah. And that, like, if if there aren't any of those sorts of things, I'm just kind of not interested. I yep. mean, I'm not I'm not actually very helpful mm-hmm. unless something needs poked at. Right. You know, and and that's and and I, uh, if there are things that just need supported or things that need maintained or things that that kind of need you know hugged. Yeah. I mean, those are, right? I and mean, those are big deals, but I'm just not the right guy to do it. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. And, and I'm not terribly motivated. Yeah. I mean, I can fake it a yeah. little bit or kind of, I got a little bit of. Right. Uh, Your growth edge is toward the, t- the two. So, you yeah. know, you can, you can yeah. go toward that. that well, I have a little bandwidth. I think yeah. we all have a little bandwidth mm-hmm. or a little bit, you know, a little right. bit. But of, if you were spending all your time oh, day would, in and day out, you'd go yeah. bananas, right? So, yeah. So yeah. I think that acknowledgement of, um that that yeah i i'm going to come in and i'm i'm going to poke things and and i might do it a little bit more <laughs> uh you know in your face whereas a type 1 they might poke but it might be a little bit more behind the scenes and just mm-hmm. addressing those kinds of things but anyhow the, the that's not the main point i want to make about that the main point is um but also if that's all we're ever doing is just poking at things and there's not somebody <laughs> holding the team together or building them back up after sure. they've been been poked at or even just uh, again I had an 8 and a 2 on a team that that were working very closely together and um they had to realize just when they were having a meeting the 8 was come in here's here's what we're going to do here's you know, let's be decisive let's make a decision in in the next 3 minutes and the 2 was like hey how are you? What? Mm-hmm. How about asking about how my weekend was or what's right. going on with me? Or uh, even the eight and the nine, they're both in that gut center, but the eight might come in and say, you know, we need to make a decision about this tomorrow. The nine saying, or the five, mm-hmm. you know, five is saying, we, I, I don't have all the information. The nine saying, I haven't considered all the perspectives. Right. So again, not wrong, just different. It's going yeah. to create conflict. And we're so yeah. freaking afraid of conflict rather yeah. than just naming it and saying, yeah. hey, Here's how I'm showing up. And I, you know, I don't always like that. So I want to get better. I want to take some responsibility for that, but maybe I can create some accountability mechanisms and have others point those things out as yeah. well. You ever done anything with Lencioni's, uh, uh, the five, uh, he called it, he used to call it dysfunctions. I have not personally. No, I've, I've listened to some, I actually, no, I think I did. I listened to more on the working genius yeah, yeah, yeah. side of things, but well, yeah, he I'm has this, uh, you know, it's, uh, the base of the pyramids pyramid. Yeah stacked up the very top as results the bottom is trust but you, what triggered that me thinking of that is uh trust leads to healthy conflict yeah. you know if you don't have healthy conflict we well, can't have healthy conflict unless you're standing on a foundation of trust right fundamentally basic human trust you know yeah. like hey you care about me right and i care about you right and we know each other enough yeah. to under, understand and this kind of test for me or, or assessment is really good at getting people to understand how other people tick Mm -hmm. uh not so much how are we going to execute but but more like oh now i understand you Mm -hmm. and the other person goes oh great now you understand me yeah (laughs) and so there's a there's a there's a a unification and trust factor that can lead to healthy conflict yeah you know and healthy conflict then leads to uh buy-in Right. Mm-hmm. Where okay, so we work through that. So now I understand, you understand, and we're in this together. Okay, right. for a, a, a greater purpose. Cool. Yeah. And then that leads to accountability, which is I'm willing, I'm willing to let you or you, you know, I'm going to hold you accountable. You hold me accountable, etc. Mm-hmm. And then that leads to ultimately results yeah. at the top of that pyramid. And it's a really fascinating little. I, well, I do that exercise a lot with a leadership team at a, like an offsite, that's a typical, kind of an easy button, uh, or a relatively non-confrontational uh, trust building, or at yeah. least kind of saying, hey, here's this roadmap for why trust is such a big deal. Yeah. Um, and you hear it more and more, I mean, all around the, the psychological safety, the trust. Yeah. You know, it's a big deal. If I do speak up, Sure. Am I going to be punished for this, or or is there a safe space yeah. here to really, or a brave space to yeah. be able to address these things and call them out? Whether it's the interpersonal and relational mm-hmm. side or the task side of, hey, I notice an issue here, mm-hmm. but if I speak up about that and it it 
they don't want to see that issue or something. Yeah. Is there going to yeah. be a punitive side? And, and the other yeah. language I've started to use is, and I just love it more and more, is like invitational accountability too. Like not an imposed accountability of now I'm going to hold you accountable, but more uh, where these things that, that invite us into some of that awareness, mm -hmm. then it, it lets me invite the accountability again and say, hey, I know these are my tendencies or my propensities yeah. in these situations. You know, I... I come in and focus too much on that, or, um, you know, it may come across this way. So I'm taking ownership. I'm doing my best to, to try and grow in that area. But I also invite you to call that out if you see it. And, yeah. and you know, and, and that plays into all the things around just more consistent check-ins and feedback too, that are so important where, you know, don't, don't wait for a yearly review to yeah. drop a bomb on right. somebody, but, uh, yeah, sure. you know, I'm checking in regularly and oh, yeah. yeah, so. Good stuff. Um, we'll talk about then the uh, another assessment, the uh, Strengths Finder, mm -hmm. the Clifton Gallup. I and it's <laughs> changed. Can't remember which one to call it. You know, Clifton <laughs> Strengths is the there most is. recent okay. iteration. I think tying it to Don Clifton, the originator, and yeah. yeah so um, not one that we use as much as the Enneagram, but again, I like it because it takes a little bit different approach to it and can be, um, we do all the leadership and development sessions for Torchbearers, Akron, Young Professional mm -hmm. Organization. And so we actually have them first take the Enneagram to get to some of those foundational pieces. Then we have them take uh, Clifton Strengths and kind of layer that on top of. Now that you have that foundational knowledge and understanding of your core motivation, mm -hmm. how are these... Um, you know, more performance-based talent, and Clifton would say, this is not a personality assessment. This is uh, more of a talent assessment. Here's the things that tend to come more naturally to me. And then if I'm putting more uh, intentionality, energy, effort, focus on them, they become a strength for me, a way of, an op you know, a way of kind of consistently mm -hmm. um, delivering, uh, you know, outcomes and, and performance to a team and to an organization. So, um, yeah, so I like that one from that standpoint of uh, it, it gives us that sense. Thank you. Thank you, sir. The Diplomatico talking about right. strengths. Yeah, there we go. <laughs> <laughs> I love the, I, th that was my first one I was exposed to. Okay. Um, and my understanding of it was, is that it's, one of the best researched ones mm -hmm. or standing on the most right. data, right? Yeah. I mean, it's yeah. Gallup's right. data, data center. <laughs> and also my understanding is that all of the other ones, you know, uh, DISC, et cetera, et cetera, draw from Gallup's data because it's this the biggest data center base or whatever of uh, – human behavior like here's right. what people think yeah like, great over, yeah. over the longest period of time although right. you know, we could throw enneagram in there that sure. we don't know it's origins yes, it's just sure. thousands of years but no sure. the more, yeah the more data driven side but yeah so again it's it's 34 core talents themes that that really get highlighted of here's uh again that that performance based how we show up and express perhaps even that enneagram type i think i referenced that earlier but if not at least it was in my head that yeah you know we we could be the same. We could both be Enneagram eights, but the way that those strengths express themselves could be, we could have mm -hmm. none of them the same in our mm -hmm. top five. Um, yeah. And and you can get a full report of your 34. I just... What's yours? Top five. Uh, top five are input, individualization, uh, belief, connectedness, mm. and um, learner. Interesting. Yeah. Individual, so that individualization, I don't know much about. I, I want to ask you about that. Okay. <laughs> tell me, tell me about that. Yeah, learner number five. Okay. Yeah. So individually, individualization is the one where, um, Odyssey. I, I say it's where I see my Enneagram three that's connected to the Enneagram nine. It's appreciating kind of the unique contributions of each person, each part of the team, and just um, you know really wanting to understand not just on a macro level, but kind of more on that micro level. What What is it that, yeah, each person is bringing and, and really getting to know them in that space. It's, it's in the relationship building domain, mm -hmm. which is another aspect of this assessment that I think is most helpful that there, each of the 34 themes is broken into one of four domains. Um, and especially when you get it down on that team level, I think for people to understand uh, you know, hey, we, we may be really strong in uh, the four domains, our strategic thinking, executing, uh, influencing, and relationship building. We might be really good on strategy and relationship building. So we get really excited up front and, and 
people really like each other and, and we're working together well, but we don't really follow through on, on many things. That may be a short-lived organization or a project or something. Or, um, you know, we're, we're, we're good on strategy and executing, but no one's buying our product because, or buying our idea because there's, there's not those influencing folks that are getting out and, and yeah. you know, drumming up some enthusiasm and excitement about it. So, yeah. um, so I like it from that standpoint. I think it's, it's quick. It's easy for teams to really kind of sink their teeth into. And then when they look at the performance and say, you know, hey, here, where's our gaps? Where, where might we be struggling and how might that be uh, impacting our, our workflows and yeah. um, our interactions with each other? So, yeah, yeah. I like thinking of this as uh, <clears throat> your, uh, uh, well, when I, try, when I first start explaining it to a client or so, somebody that I'll say, you know, look, you got, when you, are you right-handed or left-handed? Well, I'm right-handed. Okay, so when you do your best work, you're doing it right-handed. Yeah, and it doesn't matter what the work is. You could be a jerk. You could be smacking people and flipping them off. You're going to do it right-handed. Yeah, you know. And if you're painting Picassos, you're doing it right-handed. Um, and if somebody says, "Could you please do that left-handed?" You'll get it done really badly with low efficiency, low right. quality, it'll high frustration, long period of time. Yeah, right. All the all the negative stuff will come out. And you're just trying to identify what the heck is down in under the hood. Mm-hmm. of your, um, you know, kind of your talent profile. Yeah. And it's broad enough that um, it's not like, hey, you're a musician or you're a mathematician right. or you're a cook or something mm-hmm. very specific. It's broad enough that uh, it's helpful. to it, it applies to many different, you know, kind of, I don't know, professions, yeah. if you will. It's right. Not, it's and, not, and as a leader, well, sorry, go ahead and finish. Well, it's not, it's agnostic yes, to professions, exactly. I guess is what I'm trying yeah. to say. Yeah, yeah. And I think from that standpoint of a, a senior leader, a CEO or you know, C-suite or something, it, it also helps you perhaps, you, you mentioned, you know, kind of the entrepreneurs earlier, like as you're building your team, one, the Enneagram can give you some understanding of how you may be initiating that, that entrepreneurial effort. I actually did one with a, a group up in Cleveland of, of entrepreneurs that were kind of being supported, did the Enneagram, and they, they appreciated kind of that approach of just, you know, here's how I'm showing up. But then also uh, understanding that, hey, if I'm way over here, one of my favorite examples is an organization, uh, the CEO was, I think, had all five of his strengths in the strategic thinking mm. domain. Mm. And as he talked to his team and they kind of worked through it, he realized because of his positional authority. And I think we do need to keep that in mind when we talk about all these things too, that, uh, you know, the, the positional authority is going to impact kind of the way that, that these maybe kind of filter down too. If, if the CEO is an eight, then that's going to, you know, it's probably going to be a little bit more of an eight kind of culture. If the CEO is, is in this case, all strategic thinking, what he realized is because of that positional authority, his team thought they had to, execute on every idea that was coming out of his head, which was dozens a day. And so he was driving them crazy because they're thinking, well, if he's talking about it and saying it and he's the CEO, we got to make this happen. So instead, he he was the one who self-reflected and said, oh my gosh, I'm sorry. Like that is not my intent. Wait for me. I just need to get it all out there and brainstorm. Now wait for me and I need to process with some of you that are more that executing um, and influencing help me make sense of some of this. And they ended up structuring this more sales-based organization. They ended up restructuring their entire organization around strengths and building teams to ensure that those domains were represented well. And and the success that came from that was quite remarkable. So again, I think Mm -hmm. from that senior leader level, really understanding, uh, you know, here's how these talents are expressing themselves and how do I build a team that complements those things? Or again, I don't encourage you to use it for hiring and firing, but to say, hey, if all of us are very similar in our profiles, or at least in our top five or 10, um, you know, there's one report that gives you your top five, there's another that gives you all 34. Mm-hmm. That really depends on how yeah. deep into the weeds you want to get on it. But, um, you know, even with those top five, I think you can kind of say, hey, we're all, you know, our, our whole C-suite is on the strategic thinking side. Maybe we need someone with some executing, or we at least need to make sure we're leveraging those strengths with a lot of intentionality. Yeah, um, I, yeah. I read that, or at least I remember uh, learning this that uh, really we 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 do our work from our top ten. Like mm-hmm. that's really where we're yeah. 
They, and they tend to be, at least this is my understanding, they tend to be uh, migrated. They migrate around a little bit in those 10. Mm-hmm. Yes. 10. Yep. I always tell people that of, you know, that's one of my okay. most frequently asked questions is if yeah. I take it two years from now, will my top sure. five change? Eh, what I've seen most consistently is probably two or three of those. Well, sometimes the whole five changes, but chances are the ones that yeah. switch out, you know, maybe sure. some drop down into seven or eight and yeah. seven and eight moved up in right. your top 10. Right. But yeah, they don't, they don't tend yeah. to be a, a whole overhaul of, you know, those ones that were down at the bottom of your report yeah. suddenly you're up at the top. And, and again, what do you think about the situation? Well, it's amazing. Well, isn't it? Yeah, Dipl- it's really good. It's really <laughs> smooth. It's nice. What What's called? it called? Diplomatico Reserva Exclusiva. All and right. So this is, I think this is kind of their, their top tier. It's my uh, favorite right now. It's real good. It's like yeah. 40 bucks a bottle. Really? It's uh, That's the thing I, I like, like about really good sure. rum. Yeah. It's the best kind of bang for your buck in uh, high quality, you know, alcohol. It's... Because uh, I was almost thinking it has a little bit of like a bourbon-y a kind of bit. vibe yep. to it. Like, see, I'm, not, I'm not usually a huge rum person, yeah. but there's... Yeah. It almost like goes down smoother yep. than bourbon. It's the same with tequila. Tequila can be, uh, you know, it's that cheap college type drink and a lot of people are like, meh. Yeah. For good reason. Uh, but good tequila can be 80 or 100 bucks a bottle. Right. You know, and good rum is half that much. And yeah. it's just it's just a little easier to s- sip on it and think, that wasn't, that was $5. I yeah. just uh, sipped. <laughs> but uh, but anyway, we yeah. uh, we really enjoy it, Shane and I here. We have a couple yeah. others. We have this. Uh, the uh, Kirk and Sweeney. The Kirk and Sweeney is really good. Okay. Uh, 12 year and 18 year, and et cetera. And that's also fairly affordable. And then the uh, Bargelito, Bargelito is very good. Okay. The three star. Nice. From uh, Puerto Rico. Well, if people get nothing else out of this you podcast, you know, <laughs> that's our takeaway. Good rum recommendations, <laughs> yeah. which may sure. be the most important thing sure. to help you get through. Yeah, we could just know, listen to music now, yeah, sip rum, exactly. and <laughs> <laughs> figure the rest out later. I recommend rum, but yeah, uh, yeah no. So, uh, Curious about your top five strengths. Do you? Yeah. Uh, number one, strategic. Okay. Uh, number two is uh, intellection, um, self assurance, uh, input, and relater. Okay. And then after that, I think I got a, a, a futuristic is in there. Um, I believe uh, either, I think command is in there somewhere, mm-hmm. like eight or nine. Um, I think I have. Uh, I have a couple other, oh, another strategic one. I'm forgetting now, yeah, but, but but it's skewing toward the strategic. Dude, I have nothing, side. nothing when it comes <laughs> to executing till 11. <laughs> That's what I was noticing. I'm like, I'm not hearing any executing yes, in there. It's, so. Dude, it's, yeah. it's, uh, it's tough. Um, and But what I figured out, and this is one of the beautiful parts about strengths, strengths finder, is um, you're getting things done with your top strengths. Right. It just, so when I look at what I execute on, I'm executing on thinking or I'm executing on figuring things out or I'm executing on creating clarity. Uh, I'm executing on getting more hobbies. Yeah. (laughs) Right? (laughs) That's the input one, right, for me. Is that true of you? Do you have a bunch of hobbies? Um, I tend to... Because with I, I think it must be some of the belief part in there that like I go deep on things that I'm really passionate yeah. about. Yeah. So I'm more of a yeah I'll, I'll go deep on certain subjects. So is it kind of academic. So because yeah. with learner there at number five, mm-hmm. it's yeah, it definitely be. tends to skew academic. Yeah, um, we talked about sure. that earlier. We'll maybe we'll get to that when we talk about uh, desert island books yes. as well. But you know I I have a really hard time reading fiction because yeah, it's so I just want to know more about this subject or this, oh. this particular topic. And I can't like pull myself out to just say like, just enjoy reading. And so these other ones is, lear- is learner, uh, is learner strategic thinking, right? Yeah. It's interesting. Okay. What yeah. about the others? Individualization. Um, is individualization that... is in relationship Relation- building. Connectedness is in relationship building and belief is in executing actually, okay. which, uh, you know, I, I get it, but it, that's one of those ones that seems like a little bit of an outlier in executing because it's, yeah. I mean, the belief kind of anchors you in, you're going to follow through and stay committed to this. Mm-hmm. Um, but, you know, it's, mm-hmm. yeah, I think it could also probably fit into some of the strategic Yeah, things. it's funny how some people's beliefs, everybody has a belief system, yeah. you know, but some people's belief system is the thing which they, everything orbits around. I guess you could argue, well, that's not a belief system. It's kind of a you know, optional, it's an auxiliary opinion or something. Yeah. But some people's belief system is so strong that everything else orbits around it. Yeah. And other people's, it's somewhat malleable or somewhat kind of like, oh, and there's these things I believe. Yeah. 
you know? Yeah. Um, no, for me, it's like that piece has to be in place. I mean, not surprising then that I ended up at an organization that's all about purpose and values and, mm -hmm. and really uh, anchoring down into those. And even that the first 10 years of my professional career went, you know, went to seminary, worked mm -hmm. on staff at a church. So again, you know, very oriented mm -hmm. around mm -hmm. core beliefs and, and mm -hmm. okay, how do we live these things out? Yeah. Yeah. Um, what, so have you heard of the, uh, any of the other Gallup, uh, assessments? Q12 they, and yeah, yeah, a, some of those yep, kinds of things. I haven't one. utilized them, but uh, BP10, I think, or, or hmm, I don't know something if, 10. I don't know that one. Okay. Um, uh, business builder or something builders. Mm -hmm. I have to think about what it is, but it's, uh, it's kind of around, all right, it's really specifically, you're going to grow or build or develop or lead an organization, uh, you ought to have some of these okay. uh, angles. Yeah, for some reason, I haven't seen that one. I know the Q12, and then I know there's also um, kind of iterations of the, the Clifton Strengths Assessment, too, for managers, for students. and Builder Profile. That's okay, Builder BP Profile. 10. Okay. Huh. Maybe it's 10. Maybe it's 12. Yeah. I think it's 10. Yeah. Um, yeah, well, so like I said, I, you know, Enneagram is definitely our lead assessment. That's the one we get most requests for. And uh, frankly, I think part of that was it, it aligns with kind of the mission of our organization and that space was a little less crowded <laughs> as I was coming into that. I am certified in Myers-Briggs. Mm -hmm. um, I got certified and have not used it with any organizations. There just doesn't seem to be the yeah. interest anymore. Right. It seems more medical and education yeah. uh, spheres. I've taken the DISC assessment. I've taken, you know, four colors, four animals. Um, oh, yeah, the we, four animals. What, what four, give me the four animals. <laughs> oh, my gosh. I don't so even like, remember. It was like, like back in college. Golden lion, Retriever, Otter, Lion, and... There was one more it's beaver. Good. I think. I think for us it was That's beaver. Right. Yeah, it was right. the other. I was going to say yeah, turtle. Yeah, but yeah. yeah. No, I <laughs> so, think it's yeah. Engineer, get her right. done, go exactly. work. You yeah. know. Yeah. So probably more that executing. Yeah. So. This concludes part one of our interview with Jeremy Lyle. Please join us in episode zero four nine for part two. Thanks for watching and listening to the Business Broken to Smoking podcast, and make sure to click subscribe.